Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our Algebra 2 trig version of a flipped classroom here at Hamburg High School. Uh, my name is Mr. Hill and uh, you will be hearing either my voice or uh, Mrs. Hill's voice each night as you sit down to watch your video and take notes on a brand new concept each and every night. And basically the idea of the flipped classroom, as you've probably already figured out uh, by talking about it in our first day of school, is the fact that you're going to learn the new material at home at your own time. Uh, whenever you get a chance to sit down and, and log on to the YouTube and, and watch the video, you're going to have your notebook with you each night, you're going to have your calculator with you each night, and you're going to go through and take the best notes you possibly can. And then when we come to class the next day, we will check your notes while you begin the assignment, and you're going to complete an assignment in class that you would normally do at home. The benefit of doing it in class is you've got a lot of resources, you've got your friends nearby, your group partners, and of course me, your teacher. So uh, hopefully together we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be able to pull it off. And uh, you know we, we had success with the traditional classroom in years past. Last year we made the switch to the flip version we had even more success. Uh, the region scores did go up and improve, and so we're just that much more excited to take it to another level and truly find out how good we really can be. I got a couple of uh, key elements that are going to guarantee, or at least uh, you know, uh, bring you closer to being as successful as you possibly can. And, and rule number one here is the, just the idea of being highly focused when you sit down to watch these videos. Okay, when you sit down to watch these videos, we've really got to have a, what I believe is in a quiet environment. Um, free of distractions. Okay, um, I know we all think we can take notes and watch the video while we do this, that, and this, and that. But it, it really, at the end of the day, to have that quality comprehension that we need, we need a qu quiet environment with no distractions, and that just requires a little bit of self-discipline. You know, twenty minutes in, a night, block everything else out, and and dive into the video. Pacing. Do not be afraid to use the pause button. Do not be afraid to rewind, okay? I think that's really the beauty and the secret to our success with the flipped classrooms is that you can move at your own pace. If we're going too fast, you need to see it again. You know, you don't have that luxury when we do when we do a lecture in class. You know, I can't rewind it and pause it for you as many times as you want like you can at home. So take advantage of those features. Really use them to your advantage. And number two, make sure you always have your notebook and your calculator with you. You're going to take impeccable notes. Uh, don't be afraid to use like different colors, whether it's different colored uh, pencils or writing utensils, uh, highlighters, anything else that's going to make your notebook look more organized, neater, and really make things pop off the page at you when you go back to look at them. All right, so we're going to dive into our very first lesson. So you've got that notebook open. Our very, very, very first topic is called Introduction to Functions. And I believe back in your freshman year with Algebra 1, you dabbled a little bit with functions. We're going to revisit them. Mathematically, it's nothing terribly new. It's just we're going to kind of like learning a different language. We're going to introduce a lot of different vocabulary. We're going to put a high price tag on this vocabulary and just really using it well in class in our groups. Um, I do believe this is the hardest part of the video is just cranking out these definitions. And here's, if again, if I go too fast, hit the pause button. Make sure you get the whole definition in your notebook. <clears throat> Excuse me. A function is any rule. And when I say rule, I want you to think of something like an equation where we say y equals uh, you know, 2x plus 3 or something like that. That assigns exactly 1. And, and let's emphasize the word exactly. It cannot be more than 1. And that's the big thing we'll talk about. Exactly one output value. Now, when I say output, I'm really saying I'm referring to the y value, okay, or the y coordinate for each input value, which in this case means x value, okay. So, for as an example, if I gave you the ordered pair two comma six, okay, the two would be the input, and the six would be the output. All right, real simple. Put the two in, get the six out. All right couple other things. These rules can be expressed in different ways, but the most common are being in the form of an equation. Okay, It might be in the form of a graph, which you're very familiar with. Or the third one, again, you're very familiar with this as well, it could be in the form of a table of values. And I'm just going to put table of values here. Okay. All right, one more little blurb to fill in here before we move on and start cranking through some real problems. Just a little more vocabulary. Sometimes when we say input variable, we're really describing the independent variable. All right, the independent variable. And again, that's your x. And when we say output, we're really describing what we call the dependent variable. 
And again, that's just another fancy way of saying the y value. So here's our first question, and the question says determine whether the relation and anything that comes in, uh, this is called roster set notation, what you see right here. Um, it's a list of four distinct ordered pairs. Together we call this entire thing a relation, and we want to know whether this relation actually is a function or not. Um, now if you re go back to that definition, the big thing we said was that each input was allowed to have exactly one output. Okay. And so we're going to analyze each input. Input 2, output 6. Input 3, output negative 5. Input 1, output 4. Now here's the bear trap. You notice you have the same input that you had back here on this first example, and it has a different output. So because of the two, we would say that this relation is not a function because the two had two different outputs. Our next slide here has three different examples, and again, we're just going to practice our terminology. And they're asking us, what are the outputs if the input has to be x equals 4, given the functions defined below? So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to substitute, we're going to substitute a 4 in for every x value that you see, and we'll just crank it out. So in this first one, I would say y is equal to 2 times 4. 4 is my input, plug in the 4 in. And I'm just going to clean it up. 2 times 4 is 8, 8 minus 5. Let's see, i got an output of 3. On the second example, again, just substitute the 4. So we got 6 times 4 plus 4 squared. We had a little bigger number here. We're thinking 24 plus 16. Looks like I got an output of 40 here. So hopefully I did the mental math correctly. In my last one, we're going to substitute the 4 again. Whoops, not there. Let me start over. y equals 3 raised to the 4th power. Of course, we raise it to the 4th power. That's really equivalent. We're going to say that's... 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, and I believe I got 81 there. Again, check my mental math. Hopefully I did it right. So they determined what the in input was going to be, and then we just had to figure out the output. All right, our, our next example here, and I don't want you to necessarily pay attention to the exercise number. That's uh, ignore that. But it says, which uh, uh, or one of the following graphs shows a relationship where y is a function of x. And then that's just uh, basically what we've been discussing. We say each x has to uh, correspond to only one y value. And then there's another one that doesn't. So we're going to figure it out. In part A, they do want us to draw a vertical line at x equals 3 on both graphs. So I'm going to go over here three units, and I'm going to draw a vertical line right there. I'm going to do the same on the second graph. One, two, three. So about right there. Okay. So part A is check done. Now B says give all output values for each graph at an input of 3. Now in this first particular graph, um, Notice that there's two intersections, so there's two outputs. Um, let's see, the y value right there would be 4, and the y value down here looks like negative 4. So I would say for relation A there, the first graph, there's outputs of 4 and negative 4. When I go to B, though, you notice there's only one intersection, and I would say that output or that y coordinate is negative 2. All right, so part B is done. Explain which of these relations is a function. I'm going to say that relationship B is a function because there was only one output, okay? That's the key. Once we saw, and this, this, this could be for x equals 3 or any other number that you pick. We could certainly pick other numbers than 3, perhaps. But once you saw two intersections here and here, that told you instantly that it wasn't a function. Now what we just did on that last slide was actually the vertical line test. Perhaps you remember that from Algebra 1. It's maybe, maybe one of my favorite tests in the whole wide world. It makes things so easy. I've given you four pictures here. We're going to analyze each one individually. We're going to use the vertical line test to determine whether it's a function or not. And basically what the vertical line test says, you're allowed to draw a vertical line anywhere on this picture you want. So sketch this first picture in your notebook real briefly. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just get it sketched. Um, and I'm going to choose to put a vertical line anywhere I want. Okay, and basically you're counting the intersection points. If you have more than one intersection, we would say it fails. So this fails the vertical line test, and because it fails the vertical line test, we would say therefore it is not a function. Not a function. In other words, it's not well behaved enough to be considered a function. I'll go over here to number two. Okay. Uh, shoot, I gotta get my pen going. There we go. Okay, number two. Here we go, number two. Uh, again, sketch the graph in your notebook, really, really simple circle, put a vertical line anywhere your heart desires, and count the intersections, okay? Notice again, we've got more than one intersection, so again, we'd say it fails the vertical line test, 
And because it fails the vertical line test, we'd say, therefore, this graph is not a function. In other words, there's a particular input that has more than one output. All right, number three here. Pick a vertical line, you can put it anywhere you want. You can put it here, 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 you can put it here. What you'll notice is you never ever have more than one um, intersection point. So we would say that this one does, it passes the vertical line test, and therefore it is indeed, yes, it is a function. And last one here, a little trickier here. Uh, you can put a vertical line anywhere you want. Now watch this. You notice that if I put a vertical line down through here, and I don't want to cover up that hole, so I'm going to just kind of trace it this way. I've got an open circle here and a closed circle here. That The open circle doesn't count as an intersection, but the closed circle does. So if I put a vertical line right down through there, that's considered only one intersection because of the closed. Same idea here. There's, this is only one intersection. So I would say that this one passes the vertical line test. There is never more than one intersection. Therefore, it is a function. Hope that helps. Now, I'm a firm believer that all this math jargon really isn't, uh, doesn't amount to a hill of beans unless you can apply it to the real world. And so we're going to take a look at an application here. And it, at times it's going to be a little overwhelming, but we're going to walk through it together, take the best notes you can, and then when you see these problems in class tomorrow, you'll be able to pull out your notebook and, and kind of follow along and build some understanding. Uh, but basically what we're saying here is that uh, Internet Music uh, Service here uh, offers a plan whereby users pay a flat monthly fee of $5 up front, and then can download songs for $0.10 cents each after that. So you've got your upfront cost of $5 and then $0.10 cents per song afterwards. And they want us to identify who are the independent and the dependent variables in this particular scenario. Well, I just decided that the independent variable was the um, number of downloads, uh, or the number of songs we downloaded, okay? And then the dependent variable is the cost. In other words, how much money I pay this internet music surface, the cost, how much I pay them, is dependent upon the number of songs that I choose to download. Okay? One month I download two, the next month I download 20, obviously there's going to be a different cost. So cost is dependent on the number of songs I download. All right, let's see if we can fill in this table for a variety. They've picked a bunch of independent variables here for X, and they want to know what would the dependent value be or the output. Now remember, let's see why I'm thinking... Um, there's five dollars up front plus ten cents per song. So that's kind of if I'm visualizing the equation, that's what I'm visualizing. So if I didn't download any songs at all, it'd still be five dollars because there's that monthly fee. If I downloaded five songs, that would be five dollars plus the fifty cents. If I downloaded ten songs, well remember you got your five dollars up front and then you've got ten cents per song. So that'd be an extra dollar. I think I got six dollars there I'd pay. And if I downloaded 20 songs, let's see, 20 songs times 10 cents would be two dollars on top of the five dollar monthly fee, seven dollars total. Part C, let the number of downloads be represented by the variable x, okay, and the amount of charge be represented by the variable y. Write an equation that models y as a function of x. Well, that's basically, I kind of cheated, I did that earlier. We've got five dollars plus 10 cents per song, so that's that. And then they want us to, based on this equation, produce a graph for this function for all values of x in the interval 0 to 40. All right, here's what I'm going to teach you to cheat a little bit. When they give you an interval like that any time, what we could do here is we're going to use our calculator. I'm going to make a table of values, and I don't have to do every single number 0 through 40. I'm going to go maybe by 5s, uh, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. What I'm going to do on my calculator is I'm going to go to the y equals button. I'm going to type in the equation I just created. And after I type in that equation, I'm going to go to the table menu that you're very familiar with from your earlier classes. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy all those numbers off the table. Okay, so here's what my calculator screen looked like. I imported these pictures here. So the one on the left, you could see I went to the Y equals menu. That's the button in the top left corner. I typed in my equation. And then I hit second graph, uh, which would be the upper right-hand corner. And that took me to the table menu. And I don't know why it's so fuzzy, but um, you, know, you do have to do quite a bit of scrolling. But by the time you use your down arrow, you can scroll through that. And my table started to look like this. I had a 5 and a 550 and a 6 and a 650 and you can start to see the pattern now and you can cheat a little bit because it is a linear equation it becomes very predictable I got 850 here and I got my nine dollars down there at 40 so we're ready to go ahead we can go ahead and plot these numbers and see what kind of straight line we get 
it's always nice when they scale the axes for us. You'll notice they've already got the x-axis labeled. They've got the y-axis labeled for us. And I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to plot 10, comma, um, 6, and then the 20, comma, the 7. Oh, goodness, where is that? Every two blocks must be. And then 30, comma, 8. Somewhere around there, and 40, comma, 9. Somewhere around there. And then just get out my ruler and make a nice straight line. So that's what it looks like. All right, last one for the night. Good job hanging in there. And this will be the most important one going into tomorrow. Um, and this is, again, a multi-part question, but I think it's going to go pretty quick here. First thing they want to know is they want us to state the function's y-intercept. And that's simply, if you trace the graph, the moment you cross that y-axis, um, that's your y-intercept. And so I would say y equals 1 is the y-intercept. Now they said, all right, between which two, positive, or two consecutive integers does the x-intercept lie? Okay, well, I've got two x-intercepts. I'm going to change colors. There's one right here, and that's somewhere between 0 and 1. So I would say the first one is somewhere between 0 and 1, and that next x-intercept is somewhere, let's see, that's 3, that's 4, so somewhere between 3 and 4. Remember, integers are just like whole numbers without the decimals. Consecutive means they bang, bang, right in a row. And so the first root somewhere between 0 and 1, and the next one somewhere between 3 and 4. We don't have to get any more specific than that. Next thing they want me to do is to draw a horizontal line at y equals negative 2. That would be down here somewhere. Okay. Check. Did that. Um, let's see if I can pull out a new color here. Using this, these two graphs, find all values of x that solve the equation. So we've got that was graphed for us. The negative 2 is the one we just graphed. The solution, and here's what I want you to put in your notebook, that equal sign means look for the intersections. All right? Look for the intersections. And those intersections are going to be your solutions. It's probably the number one thing I want you to take out of today's lesson, perhaps. And there's an intersection at x equals 1, and there's another intersection at x equals 3. So those are your two solutions. Sometimes what we do is we take our solutions and we put them in these squiggly brackets called solution set notation. And then part E talks about storing, and I'm going to go over that in class with you tomorrow when we get to that point. We'll just do a brief um, minute and a half mini lesson tomorrow on storing with your calculator. So make sure you got your calculator with you tomorrow. Make sure the batteries are fired up and ready to rock and roll, and we'll teach you about this very, very famous feature called storing. So good luck. We'll catch you tomorrow.